Um, and I, I think what I'm going to cover here, just briefly, how the vaccines work, uh, which vaccines are approved in the U.S., a couple of common myths, um, and then recommendations on who should, and, and in rare cases, who shouldn't get the vaccines. Um, and I think for this audience, I think by now, my goodness, we're getting uh, immunology lessons just about every day on the news. Uh, so I'm sorry if all of you have heard some versions of this over and over again, but uh, what, what, is the, what do the vaccines do? And here's my cartoon of the coronavirus. We've got these little spike proteins. And virtually all of the vaccines currently in use right now <clears throat> train our immune system to make antibodies against this, this red spike protein on the surface of the, uh, of the virus. And if you make antibodies, they will coat the virus and that prevents the virus from getting into our cells and pretty much uh, turns it into a, a, an, an inert lump of protein that we just get rid of. So um, that's, th that's how the vaccines are thought to uh, work. And, and how people may have heard that these uh, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are RNA. How, what, do, what do the RNA vaccines do? And they work by, by encoding a small instruction set. That's all it is. It's a little bit of RNA, which is our body uses RNA all of the time. You know, you may have heard about DNA. Uh, DNA is like the, uh, the blueprint of our cells. RNA is kind of like the, the contractor. <laughs> the, the, the RNA fulfills the instructions of the DNA. So that's the part that's in the vaccine. <clears throat> And this little bit of RNA gets into our cell, and our cell does whatever, whatever it always does with RNA. It, it, it turns it into protein, and uh, this little spike protein goes on the surface of the cell, and that trains your immune system to make antibodies against the spike protein. But the RNA doesn't stay there forever. It goes in, it does its job. It's not meant to stick around. It doesn't change your cells any way. It doesn't... Um, that doesn't alter your DNA blueprint. So that's one of the uh, nice things about uh, these, these vaccines. They don't stay in your body. They don't, they don't change you genetically. That's one of those myths that, uh, that's out there. <clears throat> and how well do these vaccines work? They work very well. Uh, this is uh, from the actual paper. This is the Pfizer Moderna vaccine. I mean, uh, um, this is the Pfizer RNA vaccine, um, which um, was... Uh, probably the first out of the box, but if you can look at the graphs here, if you look in the, this is the cumulative incidence of COVID, and this is the placebo group in red. So you can see this is a kind of a straight line, more and more cases go up over time. But if you look at the blue line, that's what's really interesting. So everybody got vaccinated at, at uh, day zero right here. And already after the first shot, you can see that there's a leveling off of cases uh, here. And if you look at 30,000 people, you can really accumulate this kind of information. And then they get the second shot at day 21, and you can see how flat the curve is. So it's 95% uh, effective. And that was in the clinical trial, and that's been borne out in real world experience. And if you look at the Moderna vaccine, this uh, graph looks almost identical. Um, same thing, so about 95% effective. <clears throat> You get the first dose over here. You see the accumulating cases over here. In this case, it's, they, they changed the colors on us, but I, I have no control over that. It's not my side. So this is, uh, this, is, this is the placebo group. Keeps going up and up and up over time. Nice flat line here after you give the vaccine. So both highly effective. Um, you know, we started vaccinations in the uh, summer and fall of last year. And then what we did was we brought everybody in because it was placebo control. So half the people got placebo um, and we brought everybody in and, and we drew their blood again. And if they had the vaccine, they went home. And if they had the placebo, we gave them the shot. So by now, everybody in the trial has received the, the vaccine. So we're continuing to uh, accumulate data from this trial. <clears throat> and then finally, there's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, which is another way of delivering the um, uh, instructions for the spike protein. And this is, I don't wanna to get too technical, but it's, a, it's actually a shell of, a, of, a, of an adenovirus, a different virus that delivers the RNA for the spike protein. And the shell doesn't make you sick. So it's made from a common cold virus, um, but it's not, 
um, it's not an active virus. It won't, it won't replicate. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make copies of itself in your cells. It gets into the cell, it makes a spike protein, and then downstream, what it does is very similar to what the other vaccines do. Um, it was tested in, on three different, three different countries and three different continents in the US, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, a single dose was given and the efficacy was 85%. So that may look lower than the 95% that I showed you with the other vaccines. But you know, you have to remember that uh, these vaccines are, these trials are done at different times, different populations. They weren't compared one against another in the same trial. So it's very tempting to say, oh, this one's not as good as the other two. But, but honestly, that, that's a very good result. And in fact, 85% protection against a severe disease that's going to land you in the hospital is exactly what we want to do. And it also protected against moderate disease. But what this is telling you is that instead of getting uh, sick enough to be in the hospital, you might get the sniffles. And I think all of us would, would be okay with that. And so uh, a still a very effective vaccine. And it, not only that, it's effective against these variants you may have heard about that were identified in Brazil and South Africa. And, uh, at the time that we were testing Pfizer and Moderna, these variants weren't around. So that's another reason that it may quote, not look quite as good, but it's still a very effective vaccine. And then this was just the demographics of the trial participants. Um, I think we all tried our best to get good representation uh, from minority populations. The Pfizer vaccine uh, had 43,000 participants, Moderna 30,000, Johnson & Johnson had 43,000 across three countries, but it was like 30,000 people in the United States. And you can see the breakdown uh, between uh, uh, Latinx was about 28% and Black 9%, roughly similar across trials. So they really tried to get uh, as much uh, diversity in the participants as possible. And as far as I can tell, there was no difference in efficacy across the uh, either, uh, certainly against these ethnic breakdowns. Uh, they, 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 all, uh, they work in all populations. And I, just to, I wanted to cover a little bit about uh, vaccination rates in vulnerable populations. I actually snagged this graphic from the New York Times. Um, I, I, it's interactive, and so you can hover, you can just go onto the New York Times uh, website, and they'll have a section on COVID, and if you want to see what differences uh, there are, but if you look at vaccination rates in vulnerable populations, and that's, I don't know the, uh, all the details for coming up with that index, but it's based on race, ethnicity, and language. And you can see that there clearly are lower vaccination rates, so the overall vaccination rate is about 20% in the most vulnerable populations and higher, but you know, 24 to 25% in the least vulnerable. And I did find one, I had to see if I could find uh, anything from Tennessee. So, so Shelby County is, is here's that, this green bubble. So each of these bubbles, the size is the, is the size of a particular uh, county. So there are lower vaccination rates in what we would consider the most vulnerable populations. And um, I'm sure other people are much better, much more expert in this area than I am, but it's probably a combination of, of access. Um, I don't know if it's an issue with vaccine hesitancy or people that, that are, aren't sure about getting the vaccine. I suspect it's more about getting access to the vaccine, which we all need to work on. But again, I'll let other people weigh in on that point. <clears throat> and what about the safety of these vaccines? Um, it's been very good. Uh, you know, we have continued to look for adverse events. Um, no, no big what we call safety signals have shown up from the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. And people have asked whether they're rushed. Well, you know, by now we have almost, uh, you know, millions and millions of people vaccinated. And if there were going to be any major safety concerns, I think we would have seen them uh, by now. And there are some, uh, safety issues that come up that I'd be happy to address if there's any time um, at the end here. But I wanna emphasize that there weren't any steps skipped for the vaccines, but some of the space between the steps might've been compressed a little bit, but that's just because of the urgency of the epidemic. But really they had the same uh, standards of safety as other drugs and vaccines. <clears throat> 
there are very few people that shouldn't get the vaccines. Um, right now, if you're under 16, only because it's being tested in this group, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be quite safe for that group. But uh, we'll, we'll, uh, the, some of those trials are ongoing uh, about vaccinating children. Um, and if you're allergic to components in the vaccine, very rare, very rare. Some of these, um, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, um, the, the shell that they use to, to protect the RNA um, is, is um, made out of like polyethylene glycol type compounds, very common in vaccines, uh, not known to be toxic, but very rarely can cause some allergic reactions. So, um, but no deaths have been caused by any allergic reactions from any of these vaccines uh, that I've heard about. So, and we're, we're, we're monitoring that very closely. And if you happen to get uh, COVID antibody treatment, uh, like uh, President Trump received, um, then you should wait to get your vaccine for about 90 days, but that's a very small percentage of the population. <clears throat> and what about if you already had COVID? Yes. Uh, even if you had COVID, you're probably protected for some time. Uh, you might want, you know, you, you could consider waiting a little bit. They say up to 60 days. Personally, I think that if you had COVID and you're feeling pretty well and recovered, I think you're good to get the vaccine. It's my personal opinion. I, I don't think I'd delay it too much. Um, but some people get, um, they may feel almost like they're getting a booster shot, <laughs> getting like, infected and then getting the vaccination. But um, people do quite well but I would still recommend getting the vaccine, even if you've had COVID. And what about, this is a cancer, this is a cancer uh, group, right? So what about uh, people with weak immune systems? Should they avoid the vaccine? No, get it. This is, this, this is, this is exactly the group we want to get the vaccine. Why? Well, because um, if, if you have cancer or past cancer um, and you think you're, you know, if your immune system is, is weak, you're, you were, are more susceptible to complications from infection. So you wanna prevent infection at all costs. So I would highly recommend uh, the vaccine to people with weak immune systems. In fact, I'm doing a study right now with Dr. Halasa. We're collecting uh, blood and cells from individuals who've had uh, transplants, uh, organ transplant, uh, solid organ transplants or stem cell transplants uh, to see how they respond to the vaccine. Uh, and, you know, if, if this is, we're just trying to understand the immune responses of this group uh, to see whether they, who knows, maybe they need a booster sooner rather than later. But so far, from our observations, people are doing quite well after the vaccine. Um, and then some of the myths I've seen, and again, I had a Mythbusters uh, type uh, talk a, a, couple, a week or two ago. Um, with a Knoxville news anchor, but some of the things on the internet, as you know, are quite crazy. Can it make me sterile? No, no evidence that, I, I don't know how that would happen. There's some internet claims that um, some of the antibodies from the vaccine could pot potentially react with the placenta. There's no evidence that that happens. Um, and in fact, um, you know, um, being pregnant and getting infected with COVID is a high risk. You know, it can cause premature birth and, uh, and so anyway, uh, again, just no, <laughs> busted, not a, not a thing. Um, what about if you're trying to get pregnant, should I avoid vaccination? Or what if, what if you're pregnant? Um, you know, if you're pregnant, you're at high risk if you do get COVID. So you're in a group that probably should get vaccinated. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if somebody is still hesitant or is not sure, it's certainly true that we haven't tested these vaccines in pregnant women, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the option would be to be, you know, quarantine and, and, and stay safe. But any, if somebody wants to be vaccinated, I'd feel very comfortable recommending vaccination. And how long after you get vaccinated are you protected? You start, to, remember I saw you, showed you those little lines, you, you start to see protection in seven days um, you're not, you're, you, after the first shot, you're not thought to be completely protected until you get both shots of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. But uh, the, the, the good news for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is only one shot is maybe necessary. So, I mean, only one shot is necessary. That's the way it was tested. So one shot for Johnson & Johnson, uh, two shots for either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. 
symptoms, they're a good thing. Yeah, you might have a sore arm, fatigue, muscle aches, fever. I'm sure you, everybody by now knows somebody who's got the vaccine. I'd say about 10 to 20% have some kind of bad symptoms. My daughter was knocked out after her second shot, but uh, did bounce back after a day. I've had a couple of people in, in the lab. From my personal experience, that's right on the money, but maybe 10 to 20% of people are going to have some side effects, especially after the second shot, but much better than actually getting sick and they bounce back very quickly. <clears throat> and so it's my last slide. Um, all of these vaccines are, so far look safe and effective. They can't cause disease. Whatever one you can get, I would get. I don't. I wouldn't be too. I wouldn't uh, be too picky. Just, uh, just do it. <laughs> and if you want reliable information, I think the CDC is a great website. Uh, the internet is is absolutely terrible for rumors. Try to try to avoid those rabbit holes if you can. Um, and I still recommend uh, what we've been saying forever now. Keep wearing your masks and keep up those good habits to prevent spreading infection. Of course, if everybody in your family is vaccinated and you're home together, yeah, sure, you know, you don't have to wear masks in, in those cases, uh, but, but we're getting there. Um, I'm Kim Sandler. I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist and the co-director of our lung screening program. Um, I'm going to present a lot of information that's really background on lung screening as well. Lung screening is a relatively new test that we've added to kind of our arsenal of preventative health. Um, still really getting the word out there and there have been some really important changes in the past couple months. Um, the, the good news is your vaccine really will not negatively affect lung screening um, the way that it has with some of some other tests. So I'll cover that at the, at the end of my talk. Um, I will just say at the beginning, I am a chest radiologist, so when I'm not doing research, um, I'm sitting in a room reading chest x-rays and CT scans. I've seen a lot of patients with really severe COVID um, disease, and I do think it's important to point out that we're continuing to see COVID. I think a lot of us um, have been vaccinated, and now that has been opened up to pretty much all adults in Tennessee, which is wonderful. Um, but I want to encourage people to get vaccinated and also to remain vigilant because COVID is, is still with us. Um, so transitioning to why screen for lung cancer, I'm going to present a lot of data on particularly how lung cancer affects women because um, a lot of my research is in that space. And also um, this is a talk that's going to cover both lung screening and mammography. Um, and we don't really think of lung cancer as a disease of women as often as we do breast cancer or some other cancers. Um, there's been a number of randomized controlled trials that have shown that lung screening is effective in reducing mortality from lung cancer. Um, the first study that was published was the NLST or National Lung Screening Trial that showed a 20% um, reduction in mortality from lung cancer. That was followed by the Nelson study that showed an even greater benefit overall and particularly in women. Um, and then an Italian study that also showed significant benefit with annual lung screening to reduce mortality. Um, and in case you're not familiar, lung screening is a CT scan. So there is some ionizing radiation similar to a chest x-ray or a mammogram, but it's a painless test, takes le less than 10 seconds, no needles, um, it's very easy. Uh, and the criteria with which we were using to um, determine eligibility, it's, it's not like mammography, you're not just eligible based on your age. Um, we're currently only screening patients who have a significant smoking history. So the original criteria included patients between the ages of 55 and 80 with a 30 pack year history who smoked within the past 15 years. So either a current smoker or someone who quit um, within the past 15 years. And I show these criteria because they've recently been updated um, and I'll cover that at the end. Uh, so just to put lung screening sort of in a frame of reference um, as compared to mammograms, about 70% of women have been shown to be actively engaged in breast screening with mammography, which is wonderful. So 70% of women who are age eligible had a mammogram in the past two years. Compared to lung screening, only 7% of people who are meeting those eligibility criteria are coming in to be screened for lung cancer. We really have not reached very many people, unfortunately, with this life-saving technology. Um, and lung cancer actually kills more women than breast and ovarian cancer combined. And, and much of this is because of the advances that have been made in breast cancer, both in imaging and in treatment. Um, we're only starting to detect early stage lung cancer with screening, and we've made some great advancements in our therapies um, but we haven't really gotten to the point of survival benefit that we've seen with breast cancer yet. 
And um, I, I think this data is important to present as only 8% of adults recognize lung cancer as the number one cancer killer of women. Women are also less likely to be offered lung screening than men. Um, it's just one of those areas that seems to be a bit of a blind spot for us. Um, so we looked at um, our number of patients who were coming in for mammograms to see if we could improve lung screening. And in 2018, we did 27,000 mammograms at our outpatient centers um, at Vanderbilt. Um, we estimated that about 1,900 of these women were eligible for lung screening and only 400 of them were screened that year, um, which meant that we were missing 80% of eligible patients and 60% of patients, or sorry, 60% of cancer diagnoses um, were missed by patients not presenting for screening. Um, this is sort of a look at our outpatient imaging centers. Um, or 100 Oaks where we have imaging and other clinical offices. And outpatient settings are a wonderful opportunity to combine your preventative health um, visits with your vaccination. So, um, you know, Vanderbilt now, if you come in for a clinical appointment, you can be offered the vaccine if you haven't already had it. Um, and that can be done on the same day as some of these imaging tests. And what we found with lung cancer screening is that um, if you've had a recent diagnosis of COVID, then that can complicate the findings on the screening CT scans. Um, we can see what are called ground glass opacities or these little um, ill-defined areas in the lung, which often represent infection, but unfortunately areas of infection can look very similar to cancer. So what happens in those instances is we then ask patients to come back for another study in either three or six months, depending on the findings. Um, and then what we've seen in patients who have had a recent COVID infection or other type of flu or pneumonia is that usually those areas resolve over a few months and then the patient can come back um, in a year for their annual screening. So because we've had COVID this year and we've had more people being sick and often people who are asymptomatic who may have had a COVID infection and not known and then come in for a screening exam, we are seeing a higher incidence of um, callbacks for what are likely infections rather than cancer. The good news is we're not really seeing that increased risk of callback with vaccines. Some of the vaccines, and I'm sure you'll hear about this in the next presentation, are causing some of our lymph nodes to get a little bit larger than they should be. And that can be under our arms and it can be in the chest as well. Um, the lung screening CT is not as good at looking at lymph nodes as some of our other tests. Um, we can see enlarged lymph nodes in, under the arms, but that's not a typical finding of lung cancer on CT scans. So we can do a better job of delineating what may be a result of the vaccine on these scans um, than we can with what was probably a prior infection as opposed to lung cancer. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that these criteria have been around since 2013. We've been performing lung screening exams since 2015. Um, earlier this year, the criteria were updated. They now include younger patients beginning at age 50 who have less of a tobacco exposure, so a 20-pack year history as opposed to the 30-pack year history. What this is going to do is increase the number of eligible Americans for lung screening from about 8 million to what's estimated to be about 14 million patients across the country. So a significant number um, increase in eligibility, and that's in Tennessee as well. Um, we looked at the number of patients in the Vanderbilt Electronic Health Record who are identified as current smokers. And when we looked at patients between the ages of 55 and 80, we had roughly 104,000 patients that we estimated to be eligible. When we expand these guidelines to include younger patients, there are now about 167,000 patients who have been seen at Vanderbilt who we estimate are eligible for lung screening. Our screening program has had a higher rate of cancer detection than what's been shown in randomized controlled trials. We have between two and 3% of cancer incidence in our patient population. Um, thankfully, 75% of the cancers we found have been early stage disease, which is when patients have the best chance of survival. But if we look at this 167,000 patients with the cancer incidence that we've experienced, there are probably about 5,000 patients within our health system who may have lung cancer right now that has not yet been diagnosed. And we have an opportunity to find that cancer before it grows and before it spreads and to really improve survival. So a stage one lung cancer when it's found has about a 90% survival rate at five years. And if that cancer has spread outside the lung, that rate can drop to less than 10%. So early detection for lung cancer right now is really the best way um, to prevent a, a death related to lung cancer. Our treatments are improving, but 
We really just haven't quite gotten there with our therapies yet and early detection is really essential. Um, so just one more slide to drive it home, the lung cancer deaths in Tennessee and that less than 5% of patients um, that are eligible in Tennessee have enrolled in lung screening and that number will be even lower now that we've expanded our screening guidelines. Um, this is just an example of some of the uh, materials that we have if patients, if anyone's interested in, in learning more. Um, again, like I mentioned, the vaccine is really not negatively impacting our ability to screen for lung cancer, which is great. So if you're recently vaccinated um, or planning to be vaccinated soon and you're eligible, please come on in and still have your lung screening exam. You don't need to wait. Um, and you'll hear about mammography next and mammography saves lives. We like to say so does lung screening and we're still working to sort of raise, raise the awareness. Um, this is my contact information, my email's on there. Please feel free if, to send me an email if you have any questions or would like any of our materials. Um, but I think really important for this evening's talk is to know that um, if you were vaccinated recently or if you're planning to be vaccinated, that should not negatively affect your ability to come in for a screening test. Um, like I mentioned, we have had some difficulty in patients who have had recent pneumonias or infection, but we can solve that by bringing patients back for a follow-up exam and those findings should resolve. I do not have much in the way of slides. I have just a very brief mm -hmm. outline um, just to talk real quick. Um, a lot of, I think, where this the idea for tonight's session originally came from was from the discussion and the um, issues that patients have had or that imagers, imagers have had with breast cancer screening and recent COVID vaccination. Um, one of the, in the Moderna trial, one of the, you know, um, earlier we talked about side effects of the COVID vaccine and actually one of the, I think the second most common um, side effect that was mentioned in that one was actually um, swollen lymph nodes after either the first or second vaccine dose. Um, it was somewhere around 10 to 11%, I think after the first dose, and then was as high as maybe 16% in the second dose. Um, I first realized this or was even aware of it when I was on my way to work at 7.30 one morning and one of the OBGYNs called me in a panic and said, hey, I've got a giant lymph node under my arm and I got my COVID vaccine a few days ago. I think that's what it is, but like, when do I need to come see? When do we need to look at this? When do we need to talk about it? And so um, that was back in either late January, early February. And I think that's kind of when everybody really started to realize what this may, what implications this may have. I'm still encouraging all of my patients um, to proceed with getting their COVID vaccine. Um, at least here in Memphis, I do have a decent number of patients who are um, still unwilling to move forward with becoming vaccinated. And that is um, for some of them, a vaccine concern and not an access issue. We've been very fortunate to be able to actually get our patients scheduled within our health system when they're interested and willing to move forward with vaccination. For screening mammography in particular, the, um, the Society of Breast Imaging came out uh, probably a month or two ago and recommended that for screening mammography, um, that patients actually wait until about four to six weeks after their vaccination has been complete before they have a screening study. So this is for patients who have, you know, no symptoms, nothing new, no new breast concerns, um, who just need their kind of annual imaging study. Um, the difference between waiting that four to six week period is probably not going to be a huge um, delay. However, when you're talking about um, finding a swollen axillary lymph node on that study, then those patients will be having to come back for follow-up imaging to make sure that those lymph nodes do go back to normal, and if not, have a biopsy. Um, in the vaccine trials, in the Pfizer study, I think the patient, the average length of the adenopathy was about 10 days. In the Moderna studies, it was a little bit shorter. It was an average of about one to two days in terms of how long it persisted. Um, in the patient symptom reporting. Um, we still are, you know, we still have patients who have not come back to screening after we kind of, I think as a community, encouraged patients to delay last year um, at about this time, anything that they could avoid doing in order to minimize contact with um, others. So I know we've got some patients that we still need to encourage to get back into screening and get back into that routine. Um, 
but we are trying at least um, here at Baptist to time those studies to try and help avoid patients having unnecessary anxiety and necessary procedures that we could avoid just by waiting a few more weeks after their COVID vaccine. For diagnostic services, which there's at least in my practice, there's two groups of patients that are getting diagnostic studies. One are our high risk follow-up patients. So the patients that have either had a breast cancer in the past or are at high risk because of their family history or other um, reasons. Those patients, again, if they have no new complaints, no new concerns, those were trying to also wait approximately four to six weeks after the last vaccine dose before the patients come in. Um, however, the other group of patients, the diagnostic studies that are being done because the patient has, because you've got a new breast mass or nipple discharge or skin retraction or a, any of those kinds of things, those, we still want people to go ahead and move forward. We don't need to delay those. Um, we'll, you know, if there's a swollen lymph node, we'll deal with those. But in the context of other significant um, symptoms, or concerns within the breast those we want to proceed and go ahead and get those patients in for their evaluation. For breast MRI studies, that's um, it's similar to diagnostic services. There's still two kinds of kind of groups of patients that are having those studies. We have again some high risk patients that are being followed by MRI screening, um, and those patients um, should probably wait about four to six weeks after their last dose before having their screening study. The patients that are getting an MRI because they've got a new cancer diagnosis or other new symptom that, that's being used as part of the evaluation, those patients need to prep, move forward and we need to get those done in a timely fashion. Um, I threw surgery up there just because that's what I do. So that's one of the other places where we've kind of talked about vaccine timing. Um, there's not necessarily a great recommendation out there, but um, certainly that was one of the things that came up when I was discussing vaccination and timing of surgery with other surgeons was, you know, how close is too close to the time of surgery for a, va for a vaccine like this. And so the Mayo Clinic, I believe their recommendations, which is kind of what I've then been using for my patients was to avoid vaccination within three to five days prior to surgery and to await um, at least a week after surgery before having a COVID vaccine. And the way I've um, tried to explain that to my patients is um, there are a portion of people who with their vaccine may get a fever or may not feel well. If, if you get that done and the next day you're scheduled for surgery, that's not a good time to have surgery. Um, and everybody's going to be concerned about the fact that you have a fever or don't feel well, which may be the vaccine, but it's probably going to cause a delay in your procedure. Um, and the same thing after surgery. If you have surgery on Monday and on Wednesday get your vaccine and Thursday you have a fever, then we're all sitting here trying to figure out if the fever is your vaccine or if it's because of your surgery. And so, um, you know, we've given our patients a little bit of a window in which we're trying to avoid getting them vaccinated, but still have continued to try when we're having all these discussions to really encourage people to move forward with getting vaccinated. Um, because at, at least in my practice, a lot of our patients are at higher risk and have comorbidities such as cardiac disease or pulmonary or lung disease or obesity um, and things that do put them at higher risk. We also take care of lots of multi-generational families and, as well. And so trying to encourage people to get vaccinated in those scenarios too, just because the number of people affected potentially with just a single case of COVID within the family um, or some of the other reasons we've been trying to encourage patients to move forward. Um, Going to start with the question for Dr. Sandor, uh, given that COVID is an infection in the respiratory system, is there any kind of national project or initiative in place to determine if COVID could affect the development of the lung cancer later in life? Yeah, so I think that there's going to be a number of studies coming out in the next years and decades looking at what happens after a COVID infection. I will say historically and looking at risk for lung cancer, um, smoking is the number one cause of lung cancer and then it's followed by radon exposure, which for those of us who live in Tennessee is something that we should be aware of. Um, get radon checked in your basement. So free test that you can do. Um, 
So we do see respiratory infections leading to things like pulmonary fibrosis very rarely. Some patients who um, have been very ill with COVID and have had what's called ARDS or respiratory distress um, and have needed to be on a ventilator or other types of life support are um, experiencing things like fibrosis after those infections. Um, we do not know of any risk of a development of lung cancer after COVID. We really haven't seen that tied to this type of infection before, but I'm sure that it's something that will be studied down the road. Thank you. Um, I also have a comment and a question, and I'm very excited to hear about that the guidelines change and now include people over 50. That's, that's wonderful. And also the 20 packs. Uh, my question is if in the group of 50 and over, uh, there is some people that do not have any health insurance. Is there any program that will help this group part of the population? Yeah, so I mean, I can speak what's going to what's being done at Vanderbilt. There are, is currently a trial that's being done to help uninsured patients. We are just starting a trial that is going to be continuing to promote lung screening awareness for women. And if women are uninsured and meet those eligibility criteria, we will be able to cover the cost of lung screening for three years. And then we're partnering with Nashville General and Meharry to make sure patients can continue to get that coverage. Um, there's also work being done at the state level to try and ensure that patients are covered for lung screening because we know of the benefit and we really want to make sure that our patient populations who are most at risk are, are being screened. So yes. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah, Thank we you. Are, we are very much aware and, and, and it's really a part of all of the work that we're doing. Very good. Thanks. Now we have a question for Dr. Kalams. Uh, do you anticipate people taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine even after receiving Moderna, Pfizer to protect themselves from COVID uh, variants? Yeah, I get a lot of questions about mixing and yeah. matching and boosting, uh, all good questions. Uh, you know, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, even though they were tested at a time when the variants weren't circulating, the antibodies do seem to react against the variants. And they're, they're, I, you know, I think they're gonna protect against the variants as well. The antibodies are so high that even if you measure some of the antibodies and they say, well, they don't work quite as well, they're, they're at a very high level. So I think they're gonna work against the variants. However, uh, even with these RNA vaccines, um, are, they can be uh, changed in a slight way to make them match the variants. So that's even being tested in the Moderna vaccine, for instance. They've already started making different variant versions of these vaccines, um, and they just wanna see if they make the same kind of immune responses. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's definitely a moving target. We're either going to have, you know, uh, tailor made vaccines, probably from Pfizer and Moderna to deal with the variants. Um, if if some are better than others, perhaps there will be trials where we test, you know, boosting with one or the other. It, it's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. But it, yeah, but in one way or another, we're, we're, these vaccines will change to adapt to the variants that are circulating. That's a Thank you. Very good question. Um, we have another question is, and is, do you think people will be required to get the vaccine annually, like the flu shot, for example? Yeah, I think, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I don't think, uh, another good question. Um, you know, maybe it, it kind of depends on how, what happens when we get a big, you know, when, when we get a huge number of people vaccinated we'll have to see what happens with that virus, right? There are lots of coronaviruses that cause common colds. Um, you know, is this gonna turn into some mild thing that doesn't need a vaccine anymore? I don't know about that. Uh, I, but I, I, I probably would err on that side that yes, it might require some kind of yearly vaccination, uh, especially if uh, different variants are circulating and we, we've got different flavors of vaccine out there. Thank you. And I have a question, and uh, this is something that the community has been asking me, and is um, if people, it is supposed that the vaccine offers six months protection. It is estimated, that's, that's what we hear, hear in the news. So if people uh, miss having the Pfizer second dose 20 days, what is the maximum? time that they can have the second dose if yeah, the vaccine lasts six months. Oh, you mean, you mean how to space it out between? It space it out, yes. Yeah, I mean, right now, everyone's recommending to just take the vaccine the way it was tested in the big trials okay. and not try to 
try to game the system or figure it out? I mean, it, it, those are good questions. And I, as a, as a person that runs these kind of trials, to me, that's a very interesting question. You know, uh, people, this gets into the weeds here, but when you design a trial, you want to make a trial that you can actually do and doesn't take forever to get the results from. So the fact that we pick three weeks or four weeks between the vaccines, it's a bit arbitrary. You know, maybe spacing it out by six months would be better. That might be something to test down the line um, and, and, and look at the antibody responses and see if you could space it out. Maybe you get better antibody response. Good question. I don't, I don't have any way to really answer that one. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, any, any more questions from the participants? I have one for Dr. Throckmorton, actually. I'm thinking about from a patient education perspective, and there's, as I was listening to you speak about the timing and the symptoms and how are patients being best educated? I guess this is more just overall, not so much, you may not have this answer because this is so brand new. Our national organizations whom we depend on, such as Komen Foundation, the American Cancer Society, are they developing educational materials? I'm trying to think how are people best making informed decisions if they perhaps don't have their conversation with the breast cancer surgeon? I don't, I'm just thinking out loud about this. Sure. No, that's a really great question because, um, you know, I'll be real honest, like right now we've been dealing with it, with it internally with people like manually making phone calls to the patients on the schedule for that day or um, we actually are making some changes um, within our registration system as people are calling to schedule their next mammogram to make sure that they're being asked if they've had their vaccine and if they're having new problems to try and make sure that we've got those scheduled and timed appropriately. Um, you know, as robust sometimes as our um, electronic medical records are, they are not necessarily the easiest thing to use for communication in a big setting like this. Um, as far as I know, a lot of the communication has been done through the local media channels, um, largely in response to the Society of Breast Imaging recommendations. Okay. Um, I know we've done some here locally. Um, I'm not sure about the American Cancer Society. Um, when it comes to Susan G. Komen, unfortunately, one of the things that's um, happened at that level is that actually they're severing their ties with their local affiliates and ours has just recently closed, which um, unfortunately is going to be a big hole for our access for our uninsured patients. Um, so, you know, right now, I don't know if there's anything big going on a national level, but it's been in the news fairly regularly, either at the local level or there, I know there's been some stories on CNN and some of those as well. Um, since I have my microphone unmuted and Claudia asked earlier, um, about access for lung cancer screening. I know there aren't as many programs, you know, I don't think necessarily we have a lot of programs like we do through the state for breast cancer screening and, and that kind of thing. At Baptist in particular, most of those patients have been eligible to apply for charity care through our Baptist Foundation. And so when we have patients that don't have insurance and need access, um, I believe that's how it's being handled here, um, kind of on a case by case basis. Yeah, and I want to add one thing in regards to the American Cancer Society, if I can. I think, and I'm sure Dr. Throckmorton is seeing this as well, there was such a delay in cancer screening during COVID, as there should have been. I mean, we really, I'm sure Baptist may have been the same. We stopped all cancer screenings in spring of last year until we really could get a handle on what was happening and how to mitigate the spread of disease. And then patients, particularly lung screening, because our patients are very high risk, a uh, high percentage of our patients have underlying lung disease from, their, from smoking and um, other causes. And so we wanted to make sure that everyone was safe. Um, and so we wanted to wait until we knew, knew that we were doing everything we could to keep people safe and, and, and not exposed. Now, as we start to encourage people to come back, it's hard to encourage people to come back with the caveat of, wait a minute, in case you've recently been vaccinated and we really want you to be vaccinated. So I think getting as much information as you can um, from your physician and from your local um, screening facilities is really important. Um, and I'll add that with lung screening, we're still encouraging people to come in, but we don't know yet. And so it may change in a month or two or three, we may start to see things like other adenopathy. And so I think it's important to be in contact with your screening programs. If you can call ahead and, with questions, I think that's great. 
Um, there are people there to, to help with that because this information, just like with the vaccine development, is constantly changing. And so I think we've all done our best to present what we know today. Um, but over the past year, we've gotten really good at learning that things change and we have to be a little adaptable. Um, so I think that's where we are and, and we're so, so encouraging of people to come in to get screened. And this goes for colon cancer screening as well. Uh, it's so important and we've really put such a pause on that for the past year. Um, if it's okay, I have a, one last question, Annie, before I, I turn it to you. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Eliza, um, I, I said Dr. Eliza because I want to make sure I, I mentioned very well your name. Um, is there any statistics of the percentage of people that has been missing screenings and also has, has clinical trials being affected too? No COVID clinical trials. Um, I actually don't know what percentage of our patients have not returned back to screening. Um, my sense is that it's been not an insignificant number, mostly because um, in our clinic, like our number of new patient referrals, I think is still down compared to where it was. And I think um, specialists and, and those types of studies too, I think have lagged behind. I think people are in this mode of, I didn't do any of my preventive health care or other care. And so now um, I was actually in the emergency room last Monday night to see a patient and they're busier than they ever have been. Um, not with COVID cases, but I think with patients whose other underlying health um, concerns have progressed during this time where people had put, had, did have a delay in their kind of routine preventive care. So kind of, again, encouraging people to go back to preventive care, go back to their doctor if they haven't seen their doctor, come in for your screening studies, um, all of that. It, it did, in response to your other question, there were some delays um, or some um, you know, pauses in clinical trial accrual as well. Um, we did, um, you know, kind of when we paused all the routine preventive care, we also paused our clinical trial enrollment, kind of the same thing, just trying to work through um, what we needed to do for patient safety, for staff safety, for all of that. Um, we have largely, at Baptist, we've largely reopened um, most, if not all of our cancer clinical trials at this point. Um, we may have a couple that are on pause um, and actually are back to um, last month, we had more clinical trial enrollment than we have for any month, I believe any March in the past, at least six years. So I think that as people are coming in is starting to pick back up. Um, and we probably just like Vanderbilt do have at least two or three registry trials for COVID patients who have um, also had COVID to try and track those outcomes as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the wonderful questions. Any more questions? We have three more minutes to end the conversation. So I will pass it to Annie. Well, I just wanted to comment, you know, you, um, that was a great point about the adenopathy uh, with, the, with the vaccine. Um, I, in fact, one of the participants in my trial was an oncologist and she called me with severe adenopathy after the first shot um, and, uh, when she even it was it had subsided uh, mostly by the time of her second vaccination she opted she opted not to get it um, and it was she and it was a nice uh, infraclavicular node there that was clearly smaller uh, my point is that I I hadn't thought about what an impact that might have on anybody who is uh, you know prior uh, breast cancer you know survivor trying to screen themselves uh, it's a great point but you know in my case I say hey, that's ex that's a good sign the vaccine's actually working, but uh, I learned something about how that could definitely impact cancer screening. Well, and the National Cancer, the National Cancer, Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, which does put out screening guidelines, they've also put out COVID guidelines um, for cancer patients. And in addition to talking about potentially um, timing strength screening mammography. There also are some cancers, not necessarily breast cancer, where the patients are followed by routine CT scans or PET scans as part of their follow-up. And they also recommended that the, that the oncologists are mindful of the timing of those studies as well. 
um, because you can see some ad, you know, you can see adenopathy on a PET scan. You can see it on a C, you know, on a chest CT um, or a CT scan of the head and neck. And I actually saw a patient with a history of lymphoma that had never been in an axillary node who got her, got a CT scan about three to five days after her COVID vaccine had a new axillary lymph node. And that was one where we really, it was important to get it evaluated. It was important to biopsy that lymph node because of that patient's prior history. Yeah. But it is something that I think nobody really had thought about, you know, the context of this. And I had even emailed one of our um, oncologists about the lung cancer screening here and said, hey, do we need to be thinking about the timing for this? And he goes, no, I don't care. I'm not worried about people's axillary lymph nodes. COVID, you know, COVID vaccine's not going to affect their lungs. And I was like, I'm not worried about their lungs. I'm worried they're going to end up with these lymph nodes, like yep. the breast cancer patients. A so, lot of biopsies that don't, you don't need to do necessarily. Right. So I just, I think, you know, kind of as, um, as Dr. Sandler pointed out earlier, I mean, everything within the last year has just been a constant evolution of knowledge and, and different ways of doing things, even on a weekly basis. And I think the adenopathy issue and, and how that impacts imaging, I think started with screening mammography, but you may find that there's other times where physicians or groups of physicians say, this is not the right time to do this. Let's, you know, let's wait a few weeks.